Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the program where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. Now, today is interesting because we are going to be live in two different trials, one in South Carolina, one in Vermont. You have two defendants, five victims each in both cases, and they are both extremely tragic and sad cases that we're going to be covering. And the defendants in both, interestingly enough, are both arguing insanity. Can't make this up, couldn't have planned this. Now, we're gonna have an opportunity a little bit later on in the program, obviously, to cover these trials and talk about them. But right now, we have something special for you, and I wanna talk about it right now. As you know, here on our programs, we cover really the worst of the worst. We cover all different kinds of killers. They come in all different forms and types. But one of the common questions that everybody of all of our audience and we ask ourselves is, why would someone do this? Why would someone do the crimes that you see on this network? And maybe, well, yeah, I'll say yes, our next guest might have those answers because he is someone who is sat across from and interviewed some of the most notorious killers in this country. John Douglas is a legendary criminal profiler from the FBI and former special agent who's the author of an absolutely incredible book that we want to talk about right now. It's called The Killer Across the Table. Do we have it? I want to show it if we can. I want everybody to see the cover. There we go. The Killer Across the Table, Unlocking the Secrets of Serial Killers and Predators with the FBI's original mine hunter. John, great to have you here on Law and Crime. It's a pleasure. You're not, you're not the killer across the table. <laughs> what is it like sitting across? You know, I'm looking at yeah. you as I was reading your yeah. book. I, I Now I get a chance to sit yeah. across from you. Anytime you're sitting across from somebody, do you have a, do you analyze them in a way that they might not be expecting? The, uh, well, do you mean the bad guys or someone like yourself? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking about. No, I don't, no a lot of people think I'm doing that all, all the time and that I'm assessing things. I, I assess the environment if I'm out looking at, uh, I probably look at things different than you. I'm, I'm maybe with the family, I'm looking at sites. This would be one heck of a disposal site here. If there was, this was a disposal site, we'd probably never find the body. So it's kind of weird working this stuff for so right. many, you know, for so many years. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, but it's, uh, it's been interesting. It's yeah, been interesting. absolutely. Now, I, I loved your book. Um, and I was curious about this off the front. Now, you focus on Joseph McGowan, Joseph Condro, Donald Harvey, Todd Christopher Colhat. These are four killers that you predominantly analyze in this book. And while the book also discusses Manson and Bundy and Ed Gein and the BTK killer, why did you focus on these four? They're they're each interesting. They're they're each uh, different in the uh, the types of crimes that they they perpetrated. Uh, I just got so much out of the interview of these uh, four characters. Uh, it was. It, like McGallic McGowan, it was just amazing. I wish at the time I had a video camera on us uh, to see how he reacted during uh, during the interview, where he, he was responsible for killing this brownie, you know, seven-year-old brownie. And you got Donald Harvey, he who was an or, orderly in a hospital, uh, several hospitals, and he ended up killing maybe as many as as a uh, as a hundred. You have, you have a guy named uh, Joe Condro in the state of Washington. Never had a case like this where. He kills children, but he kills his friend's children. Mm -hmm. And he did this over a period of time and, and um, participated in searches. And, and so he, he was picked uh, you know, by me as well. And then I go down to South Carolina, a guy by the name of Todd Colehep, who shoots and kills four people in a, in a motorcycle shop. And that's when the cops heard me speaking at a university down there. And they said, hey, John, can you help us on that case, which I would end up doing. But then uh, meanwhile, he goes on, he kills three other people. And if you recall the case, or, or your viewers, this was a case where they rescued a woman, uh, Carla Brown, in a, in a uh, container where, where Cole had kept her for several, several months in yeah. the summer. And uh, his only mistake, he said, is I, I should have killed her. He, he, left, he let her live. I'm glad you mentioned that. So I think it was Joseph McGowan who, when he, you were interviewing, he said at one point he just knew he had to kill this seven-year-old girl. That statement that he just knew he had to kill, is that a common statement that you've seen a common theme from a lot of these killers? They knew they had to do this? Well, it, it starts off as fantasy uh, with, with most of them. It's, it begins with fantasy, maybe fantasy fueled by pornography or now the internet, the stuff on, you know, on the internet. But, it, it, but eventually, uh, even like when I interview like Dennis Rader, the BTK Strangler, a lot began with drawings and a bondage and, uh, and discipline 
and also where he could hold a woman a captive for a period of time, and he, and he would draw, draw a, uh, like torture, uh, you know, torture chambers, uh, you know, with these, uh, you know, with these women. But uh, it is it, eventually the fantasy no longer becomes satisfying for them, so they they decide to you know to, to act out. In the case of McGowan, uh, he, he said when he heard the door, uh, I looked up and heard this knocking at the screen door. He said, "John, I knew I was going to kill her." The fascinating part about the interview is that I, I did the interview in a very low lighting. I wanted darkness, I found over the years. If I can do a nighttime interview, I'll prefer to do a nighttime interview. Low lighting, very little little furniture, no, no cuffs on, no leg irons, mm -hmm. and bring them in the room, but I don't want you, corrections, to interrupt this uh, interaction I'm gonna have. And what happens is, it takes a while, but I want to try to turn on the CD in the brain to take him back to the crime that he perpetrated 30 years ago, they were getting ready to release him back into society. He had served the maximum sense for killing this, this young, young child. He was a school teacher with a master's, a, a master's degree. And Jesse, it was fascinating at one point, because when I said, you know, go back, take me back 30 years ago, what was it like? And he said, when I heard the knock on the screen door, I, I knew I was going to kill her. And what did you do? And then he talks about how he got her down into the basement. And he started talking to me about rage. He had white rage and red rage. And what do you mean by that? He said, red rage is something that, that I can control the red rage, but white rage is something that, that uh, I have no control over. And the reason he was experiencing this, this rage at that time was, was he got demoted on his, in the job as a school teacher. He's living with his mother who was away at work. His grandmother's upstairs, hard of hearing, doesn't know what's going on up there. It's, it's over the Easter holidays, the school, uh, his uh, fellow uh, schoolmates there go off, the teachers go off to the Bahamas, did not invite him, breaks up with his girlfriend, she wants nothing to do with him anymore. So the parole board's thinking that they're dealing with a pedophile that's killing right. a seven-year-old old girl. And uh, that's not gonna be the case when I do the evaluation. So he goes through all of the, the specifics of the case uh, and, uh, and how did, you know, what did you do? And he says, well, he talks about how he sexually assaulted her. He talk, tells me about how difficult it was to manually strangle, uh, manually strangle to kill her. It's a lot harder, John, than, than it is in, in, the, uh, in the movies. Takes just talking me, about it like it's no. Yeah, it's just like you and I talking about our, our you know, going to lunch or something, you know, something like that. And so this goes on, but what's amazing, as he's telling me this, it was freezing in this, in this cell that we were, where the interview was being conducted. And the guards would be looking in the window once in a while. He'd be looking out. Uh, uh, but he was sweating, and his pecs were, were shaking as he's telling me this story. He's just, he's just trembling. And so what I was able to do was to kick on the fantasy. And I was very positive in my, in, in, in my interview with him. Like, not if you go get out, when you get out. It's like a seduction, you said. That, that's you're right. Trying to get him to and you're trying to show this, this empathy and, and, and like I'm on, I'm on his side here. And, and my job is to evaluate him to see if he's going to have this propensity for future, future uh, you know, violence. He takes me through everything. And what really came out at one point was, I, when you get out, where are you going? He said, New York City. And why? He says, because another inmate uh, was in here, has an, uh, an electrician up in New York. And I said, man, he said, I said it's expensive uh, up, up there. And he looks back to see if the guard is looking and listening. And he says, John, I got money. I said, what, making license plates in the air? He says, no, he keeps looking back. He says, when my mother died, I got life, her life insurance. When my grandmother died, I got the insurance from my grandmother, and then as well as the house when they sold the house. But I, said, I put the money out of state. And why'd you do that? So the victims' families can't get any of the money. I, I yeah. read that part, and you said, "How more evil can a person get?" That really, just even more towards their family. And and you know the thing <laughs> that struck me. Uh, I'm always looking for char common characteristics. They got very defensive when they mentioned their mothers, right? Yes, you, very that much. That becomes a big factor when you're trying to understand how they were brought up. So can you explain yeah. that? Like, what is the relationship between uh, maybe a domineering mother and somebody who ultimately yeah. ends up being a killer? Yeah. 
As a matter of fact, a woman in a book review of my current book really blasted me the other day. Only give me three stars. Was five. it Mother's Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was during it, Mother's it's Day. Because I'm blaming many of these guys. It, 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 it's rooted back to early childhood. It, it, it goes back to early childhood. There, there's the, the total dysfunction there, and there may be abandonment there. Uh, they, they may be some type of physical, sexual, psychological abuse uh, uh, directed towards this, uh, this child. And so then it's, it's not that every, every child who experiences those things will grow up to be a, a bad anything, but I can tell you of the people who I've interviewed, who we and our, my other agents have interviewed in, in our research, we find this, we find this, this uh, characteristic uh, in, you know, in the backgrounds of them. And it's a love-hate relationship. And, and I know when I interviewed Gary Heidnick one time and Leslie Stahl just went to 60 Minutes, and Gary Heidnick, from your, your viewers, we remember, in the movie Silence of the Lambs, the guy, Buffalo Bill, kept the, the women down in a pit. Oh, yeah. If you remember that. Well, that, was, well, that uh, he was a composite of three killers, Ed Gein, Ted Bundy, and Gary Heidnick out of Philadelphia. Who, what a mixture. Who, yeah, wonderful, wonderful guys. And I interviewed him, and all these guys. But, but uh, when I brought up the, the mother uh, part with him, it really threw him off. It scared the hell out of him out of the film crew that was, was all around there. But, but uh, every time you get to the mother, it's this love-hate kind of relationship. Now, the crimes he was perpetrating were heinous. I mean, he was worse than, even than uh, in Silence of the Lambs. He would put women in a pit in the basement, but fill the pit up with water, with them in the pit, and then he had these shackles on them, and he would get electric wire and electrocute them. Oh and then gosh. he went so far as to, to put the, uh, take the victim, this one victim, and a meat grinder fed her to the rest of the women and his dogs. And uh, he oh. claimed insanity as a, as a defense. And I ended up assisting the prosecutor to show that, yeah, he's committing insane acts. But look at, some of the, look at his behavior. Look what he did. Uh, he, he boarded up the house uh, so no one could hear the screams and yells uh, from these victims. And, and down in the basement, he cemented in, you know, in the windows. Plus, he had over 600000 in the bank. You're trying to keep, right. make sure that he doesn't get caught. He knows the difference between right, right and wrong. The, the question is, and, and you interview them, and I remember when you said you'd, they would recount these crimes, it was almost a shift in their eyes. They would recount yeah. this. Is there a sense of fondness? Uh, is there a sense of pride? I mean, they're become notorious for a reason uh, based upon their crimes. So when they look back on it, are they proud of what they did? Yes. In, 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 in most cases, they are proud. There's no feeling. Uh, to them, it's justifiable uh, uh, murder when they perpetrate crimes like this. They're the ones, they look at themselves as a victim, a victim of society, a victim of this upbringing that they had. But, but they, they had free will. They are, are able, and I'll tell them this at some point right. in the interview, that you're able to make these choices. You made the wrong choices, but you, it was you who made the choices to decide to go out, out and, you know, and, and kill, and uh, now you should face the consequences and be punished. But when I do the interview, I'm not really a, a real in-your-nose kind of guy. And the thing that really surprised them, which is different than in the Mindhunter series uh, that you see, which is based on me and, and, and the work, is that I go in with, with no notes. I have no notes. I have no tape recorder. Uh, you I fully did, research them. You, you research the, them. The uh, uh, you, you know the case backwards and forwards. Uh, with Dr. Ann Burgess from Boston College, who we teamed up with you know, back in the, in the late 70s and the 80s, we developed a 57-page computerized protocol uh, for the interview process. But we fill out a lot of that be from the, the prison records, police files, and then the rest is going to be from the interview. But you're not doing this. You're not filling out a form. And, and they're, you're dealing with very paranoid individuals. They don't, wh why are you taking notes? Why, why do you have a tape recorder, you know, here? They don't trust you. They don't trust the, the corrections. They don't trust the other inmates in there. They don't want to be perceived as a snitch in, in, the, in the system. So some of the, the feedback that I've gotten from them, including McGowan, uh, after I did the interview with him, and then, I went, of course, I went for the parole board and, and slam dunked him, but he w was writing to uh, some woman, a lot of these guys get girlfriends. It's amazing how many girlfriends they get in, in prison. The, the worst of the crime, the more love letters they seem, they seem to get. And he was telling me, he said, you know, during the interview, this guy Douglas developed his profiling for the FBI. I looked down, he, said, he had no notes. He had no notes. Yeah. And he was taking, a, uh, he knew everything about the case, more so than the psychiatrists and psychologists. That's probably why they opened up to you, and they, they had this rapport with you. But I, I kind of admit, if I was sitting across from these people, I would be a little... Scared? I'd be a little nervous. Did you ever feel nervous? Did you ever feel scared a little bit? The, the, oh, 
I interviewed an Aryan Nation a Brotherhood guy one time who shot and killed Alan Berg in his driveway. He was a disc jockey in Colorado, and he, he was a mean, a mean guy. And they brought him in, in shackles, and I didn't understand why until they brought him in the room with me. And now that I knew why, he, yeah. he wanted to kill me. He hated the, of course, who I represent, and and, and hated. What did he say to you? To, well, that's the thing. I thought th this is a wasted interview because because. He's not saying, he's basically you know, lecturing, preaching to me, but then I'm right. thinking, no, I am getting something out of this. Because if you deal, if, you, if I'm involved in a situation with a law enforcement agency, we, have to, we may negotiate, but we have to go into, into a, a, a posture, a tactical type of posture, because you're not going to change the thinking of, of these guys. You know, they're so mission-oriented. Do any of them keep you up at night? I mean, when you look back, and I know you said Ed Gein, you didn't even have a chance to really dissect him because he was already kind of lost his mind at the time. But like when you look back at maybe Manson or Bundy or even the killers that you mentioned in the book, is there anybody that you think about late at night and you said, wow, that yeah. still haunts me? Well, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. It affected me. It affected me in my relationship with wife. You're in bed at nighttime and, and, and you may have some flashback of, of some horrification you're dealing with. But one of the worst ones where there, there were these two guys in uh, prison in the California system. They're convicted rapists named yeah. Bittaker and Norris, and their fantasy was to get, when they get out, when they're, when they're rehabilitated, uh, uh, they're going to get out and they're going to rape and murder teenagers, and for every year of a teenager's life. So they're going to try to find them from 13 to 19 years of age. They get a vehicle, and the vehicle of choice is a van, and it's usually a commercial type of van where they insulate the, uh, the interior. No one can hear the screams and yells right. or anything like that. And, uh, and then they proceeded to kill, but they taped, they actually taped the, uh, uh, the torturing it's, of the victims. It's, it's hard to imagine. And uh, I really, I got to thank you for all of your service and what you've done. It's been tremendous. And listen, oh, thanks, thanks. For, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you, Jess. Thank this. you very Again, much. Everybody pick up the book, The Killer Across the Table. We encourage everybody to read it. John Douglas, everybody. We are going to take a quick break on our end and talk about more about our live trials. Stay tuned.